I love this passage. <laughs> um, we're going to dig into it. Uh, so do keep that passage open in front of you if you can. Um, Tori, I, I apologize for the seven places. Um, take it up with the uh, first century people who named them, I guess. Uh, we do have actually a picture of where these seven places are, if that's helpful. Right, here we go. So uh, these are the seven places that John names, and the order they're in is not a random order, just out of interest. This is Patmos. John is on this little island off Ephesus, more or less. He's been put there in exile, um, and he was previously leading the church in Ephesus. He was pastoring the church in Ephesus. So that, that's his connection. He's been exiled to Patmos, and he sends this letter, and Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, it's kind of like a circular route. If you were going to send a letter to all of them, that's, that's like the route that you'd take as a courier. And so it's, it's going around those churches um, and delivering a circular letter. Uh, but I want to just look at the context that he sets here. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and in the kingdom and in the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Why does John start like that? I want to suggest this is the context for the letter. John is writing to a church that is suffering and a church that is enduring and a church that has the kingdom of God. That's, that's the fundamental baseline of this letter. It's written to churches who are suffering, enduring for the kingdom. And John relates to that himself. He is very physically suffering. He's, he's in exile. We don't quite know the conditions of that exile. There's various church traditions around it. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that he isn't sunning himself by the pool on Patmos. He is their partner in suffering the kingdom and patient endurance. And it's written to these seven churches, and he, and he lists them off. But as we're going to discover in the book of Revelation, numbers are really significant. And you'll have found this as we go through the Old Testament at various points. There are certain numbers that come up again and again. Three comes up, seven comes up, ten comes up, twelve comes up. And they have these significances to them. It's not, it's not magic, it's symbolism. Um, you know a good joke nearly needs, always needs to be in threes. You set it up twice, and then the punchline comes on the third one. It's just how things work. Um, in Hebrew thoughts, and it follows through um, into the New Testament as well, you know, three is the number of, of God, uh, seven is a number of perfection, ten is like all the people, ten is a big number, ten tens is an even big number, twelve is the tribes of Israel, and later on, obviously, we have the twelve apostles, although well, there are more apostles, but the, the original twelve, and then sometimes you find 12 twelves, and sometimes 12 times 12 times 10 times 10, you know, you get, uh, times 10, actually 144,000 you get later on in here. And these numbers have significance, not because somebody's going with the clicker, you know, oh, that's 133,000, 134. It's because that indicates like all of the people of God, 12, times all the people of God, 12, times lots of people, times lots of people, times lots of people. These numbers have significance. So when we're talking about seven um, churches. It's not just because there were seven churches on that route. It's also symbolic of like, this is all the churches. This is a letter to the church, if you like, capital C. It's a letter to us as well. You might say, well, we're not suffering in the same way that they were. And that's true. There are people all over the world at the moment who are suffering in the same way that maybe John and these other churches were. But actually, the scriptures say that everybody who desires to live a godly life will face persecution. And I think you only have to talk to somebody who's lived a couple of decades to find that it might be much less severe here, but actually there is opposition to the gospel message anywhere because it always challenges people's lordship of their own life, and that's always uncomfortable. So this letter is to those seven churches. It's to the church, capital C. It's to us. We are John's brothers and sisters in suffering, in patient endurance, and in the kingdom. And this picture that we have here, it's, it's John coming face to face with Jesus. And I want to pick up on just a couple of the ways in which um, Jesus presents himself. There is so much richness here. We could, we could literally take this chapter and we could preach on it for the full 15 weeks. We're not going to. 
Some of you will have dug into it a bit in home groups, but also if in your private study, there's so much both online in study Bibles. If you want to ask me, I've got a couple of really good commentary recommendations as well. You can dig into it more yourself. But the first thing I want to pick up on is that this is face to face with the Son of Man. Now, that phrase, Son of Man, Jesus uses it of himself um, throughout the New Testament. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. In Hebrew, Son of Man is like an idiom, just meaning a human being. But when Jesus uses the term of himself, he's very clearly, it, it isn't an idiom in Greek, so he's, he's kind of speaking stilted Greek in order to refer to a passage in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 features the appearance of this character like a son of man. And he's this slightly enigmatic character who the Hebrews interpreted to be the Messiah. I'm just going to read you this passage, or just a little bit of it, and then we're going to explain um, the significance of it. First of all, he sees this picture of, of four empires symbolized by four beasts. And as they're all boasting about their strength, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. So we've got this scene of the heavenly court sitting in judgment. And then in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So you have this picture of like the heavenly judgment over all these nations and empires that are rising. And in the midst of that, this Messiah figure arrives and he is given the authority to set up his own enduring kingdom that overcomes all the other ones. And the Jews saw this as being a human figure, this Messiah. He was an, an anointed human figure like David, but David's successor. And he was the one who was going to establish God's kingdom on earth. The really interesting thing, when you see John's picture of Jesus, it's got so many of these same elements. He's one like a son of man, coming on the clouds we already read in the previous bit of the passage, but also his hair and his clothes are white like wool and like snow. And you've got these different elements of the picture, but it's just really interesting to notice some of them are elements that are the Ancient of Days in that Daniel passage, and some of them are elements that are the Son of Man in that passage. And the point that John is picking up on is that this is not a human Messiah and God encountering each other, but this is God the Father and God the Son. It's Jesus is God. Jesus is not just a, a really good, special human. He's not just a human filled with the Holy Spirit. This is God himself. Jesus is God himself. And John wants us to know that right at the very outset. Actually, we see that coming out a few times in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation 1, you have God Almighty, which is normally the term used for the Father. God Almighty saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the last chapter, chapter 22, you have Jesus saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is God just really, really important. This runs all the way through this letter, runs all the way through the New Testament. Jesus is God. Why does John, well, I guess Jesus, through John, draw us back to this Daniel passage, though? Like, why that specific? Of all the different prophecies in the Old Testament, why Daniel 7? I want to say that the answer lies in the fact that this is a letter to a persecuted church. Daniel 7 through to the end of the book, Daniel 12, is this incredible series of predictions. Um, I've got some slides for it, which you can have a look at um, if you want to download them later. It's, I, I'm not going to leave them up on screen and spend too long on them now. But essentially, Daniel 7 starts with this picture of, of four empires. Um, you get the empire of the Babylonians, then the empire of the, the Medo-Persians, and then you get the empire of the Greeks, and then you get this unnamed empire, which points forwards to Rome. And Daniel sees these empires rising one after the other, and then God is seated and judges them. And then he gets this 
next vision, and this next vision is all about the interaction between the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, and he sees it in quite a lot of detail. It's really interesting at some point, if you want to, to sit down with a book that kind of links up the details that Daniel sees with the actual to and fro that went on between these kingdoms. And again, God is on the throne over all of this. And then there's a timed prediction, like to the year of when Jesus is going to come and suffer and die. And then there's this picture of what will happen after the Greek Empire dissolves into four. Again, if you know your history, you know some of what happens there, and you get these rival empires, including the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and he sees all of this, and then God is on the throne. And so you get this picture all the way through Daniel, or the second half of Daniel, of all these empires of man will rise one after the other, but God sits over all of them. The final word goes to God. The enduring kingdom is not any one of those. The enduring kingdom is God's kingdom. And the people that John's writing to are living under that fourth empire. They're living under the oppression of Rome. And it's good for them to know God knew all of this and God is on the throne. It's good for us to know that as well, isn't it? Actually, any church that is suffering, any church that is oppressed, any person who's struggling with opposition to the gospel, who feels unable to talk openly about what they believe or how it impacts what they're doing because people don't receive it. It's good to know God is on the throne. I don't know if you feel oppressed sometimes by what we might call Western liberalism, which, you know, says just let people do what they want to do. Everyone's truth is equally valid. Don't you go oppressing anybody else by believing that they're wrong. You know, do you ever feel weighed down by that? Like, I'd like to say something here, but I don't think I can. Do you know, God's on the throne. He judged Greece and Babylon. He's going to judge Western liberalism as well. Yeah, there'll be some good things that he'll find in it, but there'll be an awful lot that he sits in judgment over. And what will endure is not Western liberalism or capitalism or the United States' power or Russia's power or Greece or Babylon or anyone else. It will be the kingdom of Jesus. That's what endures. And so John wants to draw us back to this with this picture of the Son of Man. He wants to draw us back to the eternal kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. He's the one who lasts. He's the one who endures. I mentioned around the world there are people who are living under oppression. Who here's done the Lectio course um, in, in your home groups or some other way? There was that incredible lady, wasn't there, who was, was it from Eritrea? Um, who had been put in a shipping container for, for months, in, essentially imprisoned in, in this shipping container for believing in Jesus. People would smuggle in the scriptures. It was why she loved the Bible so much, because she'd been scripture poor. And yet, she, what little bits they had, they treasured. People in North Korea, people in Somalia, people in Libya are living under hard oppression, if you like, hard persecution. And they need to know that God is on the throne and that Jesus' kingdom is the one that will endure. In the same way that we do if we feel under the thumb of Western liberalism or global capitalism or whatever else it might be, any other ism, God sits over all of it. But do note what the, the weapon of victory is. The sword in this passage is coming out of Jesus' mouth. You know, we don't overcome by the weapons of the world, we overcome by the word of God. We overcome by Jesus' words, by his teaching, by his way of life, not by the sword. So we're face to face with the Son of Man, and all I've picked up on this slide is there's this pattern that comes through Daniel, which we, we see in Jerusalem, uh, in Jerusalem, in Revelation as well. Earthly kingdoms rise, but God sits in judgment over them. Earthly kingdoms fall. God sets up his eternal kingdom. So persevere, because the kingdom that you're invested in, Jesus' kingdom, that's the one that's going to last, and it's going to last forever. But Jesus is not just presented as the Son of Man here. The first thing that you actually read about him in the picture um, is what he's wearing. He's wearing a long robe with a golden sash around the waist. This is the uniform of the priest, specifically, probably the uniform of the high priest. That you can read the imagery in this book on a couple of different levels, because on one level, you just read this picture of Jesus and it's just awe inspiring. You can sort of imagine what it might have been like for John to stand in front of this vision and, and just fall on his face. And that's, that's totally valid just to see it in terms of like, this is awe-inspiring. Jesus is glorious. 
but there's also like meaning and detail in all of the different details here. And one of them is that he is presented as a priest. Jesus is our high priest. The priest stood in God's presence on behalf of the people. Uh, we, we sing that song, don't we, before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And drawn out among others of, of Hebrews and the picture in Hebrews of Jesus, the great high priest, entering in on our behalf. The high priest also atoned for sin. They would make sacrifices so that people could be forgiven. Jesus made the perfect sacrifice once and for all so we can be forgiven. Jesus is the high priest. But where is the high priest? He's appearing in front of John, but he's surrounded by seven lampstands. And thankfully, we're not left to guess what those are. Some pictures in the book of Revelation, we are left a little bit guessing. This one, John gets us started with an easy one. He tells us, this is what the seven lampstands are. They're the seven churches, and Jesus is in the midst of them. Isn't that good news? I mean, really, isn't that good news? Jesus is not a distant God. Jesus is amidst his people. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, I believe all ways lead to God? Anyone heard that? Yeah? Do you know, most religions don't even claim to lead to God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Most religions don't present the end goal as actually being with God. It's like some kind of paradise, yeah, but not, not with God. Actually, Christianity lays out that the joy ahead of all of us, more than what we might think of as, as heaven or eternal life, it's, it's being with God. God forever. God who is the source of everything good. He is the reward at the end of all of it. And Jesus, even now, is in the midst of his church. Jesus is with us. And what's he holding in his right hand? Right hands, again, Bible imagery. Your right hand is is the one that you're ready to use. Left-handed people were seemingly left out of the literature. Sorry if you're left-handed. So the thing in your left hand was the thing that you, you you might switch to later. But what's in your right hand is what you're doing now. And what's in his right hand? Stars, okay, which mean, it says it here, so it's not a guess, the angels. The me- now, the word angel also means messengers. So the angels to the churches or the messages to the churches. So Jesus is in the midst of his people, and what's he doing? He's speaking to them. He's communicating with them. Jesus is in conversation with the church that he is in the midst of. Now, we need to put that together with the fact that this is not just a letter to those seven churches, but this is for all of us. Jesus dwells in the midst of Wheatley Community Church. Jesus dwells in the middle of the URC and St. Mary's and Our Lady of Lord. And Jesus dwells in the midst of all of those churches that are just down the road in Oxford or in Tame or in Aylesbury. Jesus is in the midst of his churches and he talks to us. He speaks to us. It's also important in quite an individualistic culture that Jesus is in the midst of his church. Sometimes people get a bit disillusioned with church. I don't know if you've ever been in a place of being disillusioned with church. I've certainly spoken to a a fair number of people who've said, well, you know, I have a faith, but I just, I don't really like organised religion. I just don't really like church. You know, this particular church upset me like this. This particular church upset me like that. And, you know, I, I don't want to... I don't want to downplay the genuine hurt that churches can do. But what I want to point out is that the the Christian religion is not just an individual religion. It's not just Jesus and me. It's always Jesus, the church, and me. God's people. God wants to work with his people. And actually, again, that's quite a distinctive of Christianity, that it is both a personal religion, a personal relationship with Jesus, and also a corporate one. We are together the body of Christ. We are together God's people. It really matters. So we're face to face with the Son of Man. We're face to face with this high priest who's in the midst of his people. We're also face to face with the favour of God. I don't know if you've woken up in a cold room one day and then gone and drawn the curtains and the sun floods in. And our room wasn't cold this morning, otherwise it would have been like that. But have you ever done that on a winter's morning? You draw the curtains and the sun comes in and it just warms you. you am I the only one? I'm not... No, okay, good. You, you're quiet lot today. You can call out, you know. Um, just now, I was sort of standing here 
and, and the sun was out on my back. And it, there's a sense of like the, the warmth of the sun does us good. You can't mimic it. I know you can get special lamps that like mimic daylight, but it doesn't mimic that wonderful sense of being warmed by the sunshine. And in this picture of Jesus that we have, it goes through his hair and his eyes burning like fire, his feet made of bronze. But the last line is, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. I want to say to you that God's face is turned towards those who love him. And it's full of favour. Now, you might read the sun and think, well, surely, you know, a desert culture, the sun's actually quite a difficult thing. You know, it's a, it's overly hot and you have to take the shade but actually I think everybody has good reason to love the sun um, I think that's true biologically as well in terms of it being the source of all light but more than that there's this wonderful blessing in the Old Testament the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you and this is what it's referring to Jesus's face turned towards us is a face of blessing and favor the sun in all its brilliance. It's important that we don't lose the sense of reverence, the sense of awe, and John's response is to fall at Jesus' feet. We, we mustn't lose that, but also we mustn't lose that knowledge that Jesus loves us. Andrew was picking up on it earlier, Jesus loves us, and that love is, is warmth and light and life, it's favour, it's goodness, we have that parable of the talents, don't we, that Jesus told. And, and the mistake that the, the third servant makes is that he doesn't believe that God is a good, or the master, I guess, in the parable, is a good, favourable master. He believes he's a hard master. He reaps where he doesn't sow. I want to say Jesus is not like that. His face towards us is favour and goodness and love if we will follow him. He's a good Lord. Face to face with the Son of Man, face to face with the High Priest, face to face with the favour of God. We could go on through these pictures, but I'm going to leave some for you guys to do because I want to pick up on something else, which is the source of all of these revelations that John gets. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. What does this mean? What does it mean to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day? It's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? Most often we read about the Spirit being in us. That's a promise in Scripture, isn't it? That if you follow Jesus, everyone who follows Jesus, he puts his Holy Spirit in us. That's the inheritance of every believer. That's not what John's describing, is it? If, if it was just something that was always the case in John's life, it wouldn't be worth remarking on here. And besides, it's saying, I was in the Spirit, not the Spirit was in me. And I've, I've got a bit of an illustration that I hope might be helpful here. Blue Peter style. Okay. This, this is a sponge that I wetted last night. Stephen, can you just tell me how wet's that sponge? Slightly damp. Slightly damp, okay, but it's got water in it, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, this one I soaked just a little bit earlier. How wet's that, Becky? Uh, pretty wet. Pretty wet, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Apologies, I didn't mean to get it on your shoes. There we go. But look, when is the sponge the most wet? Shout it. <laughs> when it's in the water. Okay, look, this, this, this is a properly wet sponge here. It's been in there long enough that even the air's bubbled out. And look, and look what happens. Look at that. Okay, Jesus promised that we would not only be full of the Spirit, but that we would be full to overflowing, that streams of living water would flow from us. There's a state that is more than just having the Holy Spirit in us, but is being in the Spirit. In, not just having a little bit of water in us, but being full to overflowing. How can we understand that? It feels, again, quite abstract, doesn't it? Okay, great, but how do I be in the Spirit? There's a few different ways we could look at it, but I think probably the most helpful is to pick up on the fact that the Holy Spirit represents God's relationship with us. He is the one by whom we relate to God. Jesus 
says it's better for you that I go because I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. That should give us some clues. Romans 8 says that by the Spirit, we cry out to God, Abba, Father. It also says that when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. So the Holy Spirit inspires us in our speaking to the Lord, in our relating to him. But also that same passage says that the Spirit testifies to us that we are children of God. Elsewhere in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and other places, we find that the Holy Spirit inspires wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives knowledge. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. The Holy Spirit is God communicating to us. And just as much as he helps us to communicate with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is relational. So I want to suggest that to be in the Spirit, at the very least, is to be immersed in relationship with God. Utterly immersed in relationship. Have you ever been for a walk with a friend you haven't seen for a while and they're such a good friend that sometimes you don't even need to talk, you just walk side by side. Or maybe if you're more of a a coffee person, you sit opposite each other at the table and you don't need to say very much because you're immersed in relationship with each other. Does does that land with anybody? Yeah, I caught up with a friend um, on Friday night and both of us were utterly beyond tired because we both had a really bad Thursday night for various reasons. And and we, we chatted, and some of the time we chatted, sometimes we didn't need to chat. We're just in each other's presence. We can have that with the Lord. And let's desire that. <laughs> you know, somebody could say to me, do you want to have more intimacy with your wife? And I could say, no, no, listen, I've got a marriage certificate here. <laughs> and, and I know the laws about marriage as well. <laughs> and you'd think I was utterly mad. The same's true with the Lord. Like the prize is not knowing all about Jesus. The prize is not having all the right answers about Jesus. The prize is Jesus. And the truth is that although one day we will be face to face with him and there will be no barrier and we will know him and be perfectly known, the truth is we can know him now and we can know him more today than we did yesterday. It's true because God wants to be known. God chooses to make himself known. He is a revelatory God. And this book is designed to help us in that because it is, as we talked about two weeks ago, the revelation of Jesus. Now, you can't give people instructions to make friends because everyone's different. Actually, Gordon and Jill, you've been on something called Friendship Lab, haven't you, helping them to to develop that. And I've actually stolen a bit of Sheridan's material for this, but um, I'll I'll tell him later, it's fine. Um, But what you can do is you you can think of some elements that make a good friendship And you can look at a friendship and go, is there something I could invest in more to to improve my friendship? It's not like a, here's a set of instructions you must follow. Because if you go to your friend and say, listen, what we need to do is go for coffee today because then we'll have good friendship. It's a bit weird, isn't it? But what you can do is say, oh, yeah, okay, actually, we don't really do much spontaneous meeting up. Maybe we should do more of that. I want to say it's the same in relationship with God. What I want to do is give you five elements of relationship with God drawn from a mixture of the scriptures and also my own experience talking with people. These are five elements that I think are really important in developing and cultivating closer relationship with God. And as we talk about them, I want to encourage you to think, is this one where actually I could do with putting more in? Because maybe then I would find it easier to be in the spirit on the Lord's day and every other day of the week as well. The first one is truth. Um, I was reflecting how to explain this Um, I could perhaps book a holiday to the Okavanga Delta for Caroline and I. We we could do with getting away, couldn't we? And the Okavanga Delta, I've seen it in nature programs, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful when it floods. Um, But the reality is Caroline hates mud and she gets bitten to death by insects. It it wouldn't be a plan based on the truth of who Caroline is. (laughs) She'd hate it, I think. I mean, maybe, maybe the beauty would overcome that. But the reality is that we have to know God in truth. We have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Because if we're worshipping somebody God isn't, we're not really going to relate to God. And the place for that is the scriptures. We've got 66 books of it, of what God is like, of the truth about him. And so it's got to start with truth. So I want to say, first of all, if you're not in the habit of regularly just digging into the scriptures and saying, let's, let's, Get this into my heart. Not just read it through, because I know I should, because I'm a good Christian, but like, let it get in here. If that means reading big chunks, if that means just spending time on one verse, whatever works for you to get it from the page into your heart, invest in that, because we've got to worship God in truth. 
The next one then is time. I find it really interesting. We were talking about Daniel earlier. Daniel clearly is a really busy man. He's one of the highest administrators in the whole of the kingdom of Babylon. And yet he finds time to be on his own with God. When he's under the most pressure, he still takes time three times a day just to be with God and to pray. Unsurprisingly, he's somebody God can speak to and give these incredible revelations. There's a wonderful interaction in Genesis between God and Abraham about what God's going to do with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it comes when these three visitors have come past and Abraham's welcomed them in and hosted them and sat and eaten with them. Actually, I think he stands by while they eat even. But he spent that time with them. There's no substitute for good time with the Lord. Sometimes it's really costly. I confess this morning didn't go quite as planned. Um, the alarm went off at seven and you know, we, we have to get going with getting the kids out the door at quarter to eight. And the time went, quarter to nine, thank you. The time went by um, faster than I'd thought. Uh, but there was time with the Lord in that. And I want to suggest if, if your Sunday morning routine doesn't feature like just spending some time with the Lord, that's a really easy win. If it means setting the alarm half an hour early, I know that's tough on a Sunday, but do you know what? It's not that tough, is it, really? Um, and you just get to spend that time with the Lord. The third one is, is love. Now, that might sound like an odd one. I, I thought about the word passion, but I think it means perhaps different things to different people. There's a lovely time in the Old Testament when the prophet Elisha is with the kings of Judah and Israel, and they want to hear what God's got to say, and he just says, bring me a harpist. And the harpist comes along and starts to play, and then Elisha prophesies. Now, you find other instances of this kind of thing throughout the scriptures, but there, there's something of like knowing what is it that stirs my heart to respond to the Lord. For some of you, it'll be a hymn. Like there's a hymn that just causes your heart to lift and your eyes to lift to Jesus and for you to just, you know, remember how much you love him. For some of you, it'll be a particular piece of music. For some, it might be going out into nature and seeing what he's made. It may be a passage of scripture, like a particular image, maybe, from the scriptures. But you'll know what it is. Those things which when you hear them or see them or smell them or whatever it might be, you suddenly think, oh, Jesus, you are amazing. I want to suggest it's good to push into those. They help build that closeness of relationship in the same way it would be with any other relationship. The fourth one then, conversation. I love that um, you get these kind of backwards and forwards with God in the Bible. Actually, I loved hearing that from, from Andrew. That backwards and forwards of, I want you to give me all of you. Andrew sort of saying, yes, okay, but you know, you need to, you need to do this. You need to have this, this being the message at the harvest service. And then God doing that. And then Andrew's response to that and God's response to Andrew. I love hearing about those. You see it throughout the scriptures as well. Peter on the roof and God gives him this vision of this sheet coming down from heaven and saying, you know, get up, kill and eat. And there's all these unclean animals. He goes, no, surely not, Lord. And God says, yeah, no, don't call anything unclean if I've called it clean. And then it repeats, just in case he hasn't got the message. And then one more time, just to be really, really sure. This backwards and forwards that you get. We're probably all naturally ones who lean towards listening or lean towards speaking. I'm not going to look at anybody at this point in time. You know who you are. Um, there are some people who are just very, very content with silence and love to listen to others. And that's great. And listening to the Lord is really important. But so speaking... And I want to say, if you're somebody who likes to largely sit quietly listening to the Lord, he wants to hear your voice. And I want to encourage you to, to make sure that you're also speaking to him. Not just asking for things, but, but telling him how good he is. Committing to follow him. Thanking him for what he's been doing in your life. Perhaps you're the other way around. Perhaps you're somebody who's very, very quick to speak. And listening's a bit more of an effort for you. I want to say God loves to hear what we've got to say, but he wants to speak to us as well. And sometimes you've got to leave a little bit of a gap if you want him to speak. But more than that, conversation isn't just... Uh, we, we have business meetings. Sometimes Gordon and I will go for a, a walk and we both come with a list, don't we? And we're like, here's the things I need to talk to you about. You say, here's the things you need to talk to me about. And that's great. And that, it's, it's a good way to interact, but that's a meeting. Other times we go for a walk around Shotover and we just that the conversation ranges all over the place as we respond to what the other person's saying and they respond to what we're saying. And that's conversation. I want to say the Lord wants that with us as well. 
If your prayer life is simply, God, I'm going to pour out all the things that I want to pray for, and then I'm going to sit and listen to what you've got to say and read the scriptures and hear what you have to say through that, I want to say that's brilliant and there's more. God wants that interaction. He wants you to listen to what you're saying and respond to it. And when you speak, he wants to respond to you. And then lastly, memory. And this one, it's a small one, but like, do you journal? Do you keep notes of things that God said to you? I I don't know, Andrew, if you wrote that down or if you just have a fantastic memory. I guess it it was a life-changing situation, wasn't it? And so it sticks with you. But as you read through Daniel, for instance, he gets onto this point where he suddenly, he's thinking back about what God said through Jeremiah's prophecies. And he goes, I think our 70 years is nearly up in, in Babylon because he remembers what God's spoken. I want to say, when we, when we remember what friends have said to us, it honours them and they know that we love them. Do we remember what God said to us? If that means writing it down, then write it down. If, if you keep it all up there, that's great. Most of you know I'm rubbish with paper. I keep it on my phone. I've got like a little blog, basically, that only I can see. And I just note stuff down there. Whatever works for you, but remember what God has said to you, because that honours the fact that he speaks. Remember what you've said to God, because, uh, David, we were chatting this morning, weren't we, about there's been two school prayer meetings now, and we've seen breakthrough. Actually, Stephen, you were talking um, about six months ago about the fact that we prayed for more young people in our kids' group, And then God provided them. If we don't remember that we prayed, we don't see that it was an answer to prayer, and we just think it happened. But actually, it was God being faithful in answering prayer. So remember, whatever it takes to remember. Um, Because (laughs) this is a lovely quote from Eugene Peterson talking about Revelation. God speaks, declaring his creation and his salvation so that we might believe So that is that we might trustingly participate in his creation of us and his salvation of us. The intent of revelation is not to inform us about God, but to involve us in God. Now, it sounds like a good soundbite, but I've turned it over and over and over and over. I I think this is absolutely true. God doesn't just speak so that we understand him more. That's part of it, but he speaks so that we are involved in what he is doing. That's why John is his partner, not just in suffering and endurance, but in the kingdom. He's a partner in the kingdom. You are a partner in the kingdom, Rachel. You're a partner in the king, kingdom, Chris. You're a partner in the kingdom, Simon, Danielle. You, know, you are a partner in the kingdom of God. You're involved in God because he is the God who speaks and listens. So I want to leave us with that. What area do you think you could invest in so that you can be more fully in the spirit? Not just the spirit in you, not just an occasional watering like that sponge, but in the spirit. Which area might perhaps be a good one for you to invest in? I'm going to leave a bit of space now. Various conversations we've had, I know that some people really love responding in song and some people really love silence. So we're going to do both. Um, I'm going to leave about five minutes of silence now. If you already know what it is you want to talk to God about, then go for it. If you don't, can I suggest that you read over this passage Um, verses 12 to 18, I guess, really. This picture of Jesus and what he says. Read it over and allow your heart to be stirred in love for him. Ask him questions. Tell him what it is that you see in there that you love. We'll have, yeah, four four minutes of silence to do that. And then I'm going to hand over to the worship group to lead us in singing.